DBE fam, welcome back to the show. We've got the one and only Tracy O'Malley here. I'm going to have a shit eating grin on like the whole time, like ear to ear. Anytime I see you, this is how I feel. Tracy, welcome to the show. Oh, so honored to be here. I love you so much. I'm excited to see your beautiful face. I know. So we met back in like 2019, I think 2019, 2020, something like that in a mastermind. And it was like an instant connection, but you're super triggering. (laughs) (laughs) I I am. I really am. Because you just saw like through me and you hadn't met me. I don't know if you knew anything about me, but we just kind of introduced each, you know, ourselves to each other. And it was like, all of a sudden I felt like I was naked. Like I felt like I had no clothing on and you just are super triggering, but in the best way possible. Well, I say that about being triggered, like usually we're pissed off by it. And, you know, for 40 years of my life, if somebody triggered me, they were the enemy. Right. Yeah. And what I've learned in my own, like humility and growth and grace and grit and all the things that life takes you on is like triggers are the greatest opportunity for growth. If you're open to it. And when the students are ready, the teacher, the tools appear and it's what you do with that moving forward. So when people say I trigger them, I smile. I'm like, good, good. (laughs) You know, in the past, I used to get off on being that trigger for people because it was a power play. Hello, Mm -hmm. Enneagram 8. Um, You know, I used to be like, yeah, because I got you. Like I'm stronger than you. I'm more powerful than you. And I used to like ego get off on that. Yep. And now it's like, I, I take that responsibility of being that triggering kind of person very, very seriously and with love and compassion and grace today. Yeah. So like, yay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I love that. We were probably like two sentences into introducing each other to each other. And yeah. you looked at me and you said, are you familiar with Enneagram? Which I was. And I said, yes. And you said, are you a three? And I was like, yes, but how did you know that? I'm like, do I smell like a three? (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's the beauty of doing this work, not just in the Enneagram, but like my whole life, I've had to pick up on energy and, and people, you know, part of that comes from growing up in a highly toxic alcoholic home where I had to read a room very, very quickly and determine kind of how to survive and be safe. And obviously I use that throughout my life to survive. But when I really dove into my personal journey at the age of 28, it's like, how do I leverage this gift of survival into something better for me and anybody that I touch? And so, yes, I use the tool of the Enneagram, but I'm always picking up on energy and cues to what motivates people. And I could just, I could feel your essence and that, that thing. And and I typically trigger threes. So I know that. And I used to judge threes so harshly. So there's this endearing thing that when I come across a three, especially a three that I know is here to grow. Like I just, I, I love threes that are in that space because you're, you're putting the masks down, you're putting the armor down and you still are the ones that get shit done better than anyone. And I admire the hell out of that. But when you are transparent and vulnerable, like that's the magic that makes threes unstoppable in this world and fulfilled. I don't think it's any accident that this actually just happened. I sent an email out, I don't know, 15 minutes ago to my email list it was a pretty vulnerable email. It was mess. It, uh, the subject line was something like a page from my business diary. And I wrote mm-hmm. three recent mistakes, like three big flops that happened in the business recently. And then I kind of told the lesson that I took from it. And within seconds I was inundated. And I mean this humbly, but like yeah. messages were just coming in, coming in, coming in. And I'm, this pattern's coming up a lot recently. Like I just shared about a recent loss that we had. And anytime I have been vulnerable, which is pretty much always in my business, but whenever I do share and I take the mask off, I think people sometimes forget that maybe I'm human or people that are successful 100%. or people that make money or people that have the followers. It's like, you forget that they go through human stuff. And anytime I share that type of stuff, the like relationships that come out of it and just the connection that comes out of it and how healed I feel like it's crazy how it's this symbiotic, mm-hmm. oh, you understand me, but I'm also like, oh gosh, I feel understood. <laughs> Yeah. Like the thing with threes typically is like, you're motivated by a form of significance in the form of, um, what you do, what you achieve and how you appear in the world. And so sometimes even not even conscious, you walk through life masked up and Mm. like 
you know, see the goal, hit the goal. And you focus so much on the goal line that you miss the soul line along the way. And that's the beauty also of being your age and having hard things happen that you are recognizing and you have in the time, in any of the time, the past four or five years that I've known you, um, you recognize that transparency and vulnerability is what makes you the best and what makes you excellent, not just for yourself, but for the greatest good of those that you're here to know the way, go the way and show the way for. And when three do that, you guys, any three that's listening, like you are excellent because you are here, not because of what you do, what you achieve or how you appear in the world. Trust me, you will still get it done better, more efficient, more effective than anyone else in the world. We know you're the best. We all want to be like you. Seriously, you make it look easy. But when you do share the vulnerabilities of the hard, of the life hits that happen, yeah. no matter how great you are and your resilience and your resourcefulness and your willingness to grow through it and show us, um, that's what makes us like love you even more and think you're the best. So- well, that's all the time we have for today. I mean, I got out of this what I needed. <laughs> Thanks for coming to our TED Talk. <laughs> okay, so before we get into some of the Enneagram stuff, and thank you for that. That really is such a beautiful yeah. reminder for any of those threes out there. So before yeah. we break all that down, you mentioned at 28, you sort of had this, this yeah. moment, this awakening, this experience of like, what am I going to do with this? How can I use this to my good? Was that a moment where you hit rock bottom? Like why 28? So God, I have goosebumps all over. Cause I, I always find that 28 year old, 28 year olds find me and it's not lost on me that that happens. And, you know, I, like I mentioned, I grew up in a pretty toxic, alcoholic, emotionally unavailable home. And I was left to kind of play chess with the playing pieces in our household. And I did it very, very well. And when I was 20, I met the person I would marry and he was from Arizona. I lived in Chicago my whole life. And I really believed the only way I had a right to leave that household was to get married. Like subconsciously, I wasn't sure. aware of any of this, but really to leave my father, the only reason I thought I could justify that was to get married. So at 21, I got married and moved to Arizona and literally thought I could outrun, outlast, outsmart, outdo anything of what I grew up with. I'm like, I'm just going to set up shop over here, 3,000 miles away. I'm going to have my husband and my two kids and the two golden retrievers and a mortgage. <laughs> and seriously, I got this. Yeah. And the minute we say we got this, we're kind of screwed. And even though on paper, like seriously, by the age of 27, I had all those things. And my daughter is now 27. And I look at her, I'm like, oh my gosh, so like seriously, that's crazy. But what happened at 28 was my daughter turned four and, you know, I didn't have many childhood memories, quite honestly. Um, that usually happens when you've been in survival mode as long as I did. And when my daughter turned four and she looked just like me, I was filled like all this rage I had suppressed and stuffed and outrun and, and powered through all of a sudden was coming up to the surface and I wanted to spew it onto her. Mm -hmm. And she is like a free spirited, most beautiful Enneagram seven, like butterfly, hippie gypsy, like everything that I wished I had had the opportunity to have available to me. And I was filled with so much resentment and rage towards her. And I caught myself cause I was like, whoa, if I don't understand what's happening right now, one of two things are gonna happen or both. Um, I'm going to clip her wings so much by trying to make her like me, which is impossible. Hmm. Um, or I'm going to lose her or both. Yeah. And I didn't want that because I don't have a relationship with my own mother. I never have. Like she's emotionally been checked out my whole life um, doing the best she can. And I did not want that generational thing to continue. And so I was like, what the hell is all of this about? Where is this rooted from? I didn't know any of this like childhood trauma shit. I didn't know any of this, but I also knew that like in our household and in our family pride and loyalty and, you know, that Irish, you mm -hmm. know, you do as I say, not as I do, you're better seen than heard. Like all that kept playing in my head, but I knew like what got me here won't get me, you know, into a different place. And if you don't repair it, you repeat it or it gets repeated or both. And so I decided to walk into the rooms of Al-Anon for the first time which is um, kind of a 12-step program for people who've been affected by addiction of some sort. 
And when I first walked in, I was like, oh my God, you guys are all a bunch of victims. That's like, that's how I felt. Enneagram eight energy for sure. You, Walking- that's like the challenger, right? Yeah. 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 The active controller or the challenger, you know, motivated by being strong. Weakness is like the worst case scenario. Being yeah. weak is our biggest fear. Like you sucking at anything is your biggest fear. Being weak is my biggest fear. And even though like I was low key judging all these people. I picked up some literature like codependent no more, which I was like, codependent, I'm the most independent person in the world. I didn't know what codependent meant, right? Um, but I was classic case of the hero complex and codependency. And at the same time, um, this movie, when a man loves a woman came out with Meg Ryan and I was the daughter in that movie and also the mother in that movie. And so I, I I started kind of doing this inner child work work 23 years ago before it was like cool to do it. And before, you know, social media and internet was really here. Internet was just starting when I was 28. And so I started to dive in, but told no one it was, it was kind of like this secret thing I was exploring, um, even with family and my husband at the time. And, Um, I would have like four steps forward, three back, four forward, three back, because muscle memory is no joke. And environment is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And because I hadn't put myself in an environment where this was safe to exercise and talk about, and I had a three and a four-year-old, you know, and a mortgage and, you know, a business and all these things. Um, So the first 10 years of, or 12 years of my personal development journey were kind of like in the closet, but Mm. it was my daughter turning the age the age that I remembered my innocence and my childhood and my ability to uh, rise up and speak for myself really was robbed of me at that age. Yeah. And she triggered me. Like I said, the greatest opportunity to grow is when you're triggered. And I, I took that very seriously through the heart, the eyes and the, the, the soul of my own daughter. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, is this when you get into Enneagram, when you're doing some of this inner child work and personal development, at what point do you get into Enneagram? Yeah, no, it was um, about 12 years later. So I had just turned 40 and been through the recession. Um, I live out here in Arizona and we were hit hard by that. And, you know, a lot of it was circumstance. A lot of it was some choices, too many eggs in one basket kind of thing. Not, not enough diversification. My business that I had was doing well, but I had all the eggs in one basket. And one of my um, biggest clients decided to go in-house with the service that we provided, which was a very smart business move. I didn't know why he didn't do it sooner, but gave me no warning, did it overnight and took my operations manager with him. And I was through a messy divorce. It was really tumultuous and the recession. And with 85% of my business going away overnight, I had a decision to make. Do I rebuild this with my ex-husband or do I go do something else? Um, And my kids were, you know, 13 and 14 at the time. So like I've been home, right? But going out and getting a job. And then at the same time as all this is happening, my dad gets diagnosed with cancer and 12 days later, he dies literally 12 days from diagnosis oh my gosh. to death. And he was the strongest man. I know, you know, although, you know, a train wreck in his own. Yeah. Right. Um, and I had just turned 40. It was kind of like God just walloped me upside the head with a two by four and said, do I have your attention now? Mm-hmm. Because you are here for much bigger things than what you're doing. And, you know, my coping mechanisms weren't great, although I could be a workaholic and a high achiever and all those things. I also didn't know how to blow off steam without anger management problems, without yeah. some alcohol and whiskey and food and body dysmorphia and anything that you can use to cope except for drugs I have used. And when I lost my dad, I had a choice to make. It's like, okay, do I use what I've always used and repeat the cycle or do I get a whole new toolbox? And I decided to get a whole new toolbox, but that included wiping out my entire social network because my environment was much stronger than my willpower. And I was willing to let go of anything, any financial security. I was, by then I was the sole provider Did you, Um, were you just kind of ghosting people or did you actually have conversations with people like this is no longer working for me? Uh, I, I'm back in the day. The only way I know how to end things was very explosively and very abruptly. Um, because I vulnerability, I deemed as weakness back in the day. 
Um, I wouldn't say, you know, this isn't working for me because the strong person in me believes I can fight through anything. I can make anything work. Mm -hmm. And the only way I knew how to end things without appearing weak was to just blow shit up. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how I learned how to do that. Um, and that's how I operated back then, but really let go of everything and everyone. Um, I had had a corporate job and I was the financial sole provider, uh, for my kids and I, at that point, but decided like, I'm going to bet on myself here and walked away. I walked into my boss's office and he was grooming me to run the entire place that I wow. was working at. And I said, listen, if I stay here, I'm going to die. I'm not telling anyone I'm leaving, but you don't say anything till I'm out the door. I don't, I'm leaving. Yeah. And then the next day I told my kids that I was going to check myself into rehab for 30 days. Um, wow that I didn't know how I was going to make this happen, but I knew why. And they were the reason why. And my son, he was 14 at the time said, I don't, I don't want to lose you the rest of my life. So I'll give you up for 30 days. And it was in rehab on day two that I was introduced to the Enneagram by my therapist who I still see to this day. And she wanted me to take this Enneagram thing. And with very colorful language, I told her, go <laughs> F yourself. I don't need another label. I'm walking in here with plenty. I don't need another label. I just need you to help me fix my life. Yeah. And she, without missing a beat was like, listen, your best thinking has gotten you here, my dear. And this might actually help you get out of the box that not only the world has put you in, but you've also put yourself in. And so I surrendered in that moment and said, okay. And that's where my Enneagram journey began. It's where I found compassion for myself for the very first time in 40 years. And so that's where the journey began. Unbelievable. I have had goosebumps multiple times as you're talking and tears in my eyes. I actually don't think I knew all of that. No. No, I knew some of it. I didn't know all of it. Just incredible. Absolutely incredible. So it's in this moment, you can kind of call it like a rock bottom. It's a, it's yeah. an aha, right? It's a pivotal moment. Oh yeah. That yeah. was rock bottom for sure. Yeah, for sure. And now you're what? 11 years. You September was 11 years. Is that right? It'll be, it'll, yeah, it'll be 12 this September. Good memory. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. So yeah. For like a hundred percent Irish girl to be sober. Are you kidding <laughs> right? me? Like I was, I came out of the vagina drinking and fighting and literally don't do either anymore. It's, it's crazy to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the one thing I feel like whenever I introduce you, like if you're speaking somewhere or if, if I'm introducing you to someone at an event or something, I always say like, you have the most calm and grounded energy you just have such a motherly energy. You make everybody feel welcome. You're such a good listener. And it's wild to think that there was like a different version of you that I never met. Cause I'm like, oh, no, you had a temper. Get out of here. <laughs> oh, I joke all the time that like my son asked me the other day, he goes, do you think you could actually get away with like murdering someone and get, <laughs> not get caught? I'm like, probably like if it was somebody like, yeah, I could do that. If, and if it was for somebody that I loved, you bet your butt. Um, yeah, I, it was that anger was so strong. And here's the thing. Anger is usually the bodyguard to sadness. Yeah. And because sadness felt like weakness in me, I was angry all the time. Um, and it doesn't serve me anymore. I, of course I still get angry. Anger is a healthy emotion when channeled properly. Yeah. Right. But I usually channel it very quickly into a more nurturing, um, compassionate place because I, I do understand that. And, yeah. and it's very hard to find safe places to do that. Yeah. And I do it for all the 28 year olds that come my way for all the four year olds that felt like that was robbed from them. Um, you know, I, I take pride in being like that motherly nurturing, um, safe guidance for somebody and protective. Too. Yeah. Well, you're doing it really well. And I just, I commend you for the work that you've done because it's, mm -hmm. it's very obvious, you know, that you have done the work and you continue to do the work and we all get to reap the benefits of that work, which is just incredible. Yeah. You good if we shift gears a little? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So you start learning about Enneagram. And start realizing, I think this is, this is true. Start realizing like, wait a minute, I can almost place and understand people in my lives as different Enneagram types. And when I understand kind of how they function and, and what gets them going, I can communicate with them better. So you dive full force in, this is so long before social media it makes cool. it trendy. Yeah. 
I mean, you're a decade early on this, if not more. And so you dive into Enneagram and start using it first in your house. Yeah. Okay. So talk us through that. So day two in rehab, obviously I'm assessing my life and learning about the Enneagram and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my goodness, I only speak eight language, Enneagram eight language. And I've been trying to put my kids in that box of eightness and they aren't eights, not even close. They're not remotely like me and they're very different from each other as well. So my first kind of exploration was like figuring out where my kids felt in this framework and the system that is the Enneagram. And I recognized right away where both my kids fell based on what motivates them, not behaviors, right? This is the the cool part about the Enneagram is when you understand the, the core motive for each person and the core fear, you can speak to it and it, things don't be, things aren't taken as personally. And, and I started to understand why my son would have anxiety attacks when I was even in the room and why my daughter was an escapist. And I recognize like, oh my gosh, I have an Enneagram two son and an Enneagram seven daughter, and they are different from me and different from each other. And I really wanted to understand what motivates them. And I, again, met myself with compassion because I found that I harshly judged them and obviously didn't verbally say that to them, but energetically I was judging them. I thought my son was weak yeah, and like, that is hard for me to even say out loud, but it was just the truth. And I didn't want that because he's the strongest man I know quite honestly. And he's 26 now and he's still an Enneagram too, and still highly sensitive and highly empathetic. And he's the strongest man I know. And so when I I saw what their fears were and I saw what happens when that gets triggered, no wonder we would have these explosive blowups. And I never went home and said, you're an Enneagram seven, you're an Enneagram two. I just started speaking to it as though that that is what they were. And it landed. And I knew that right away. And overnight, the culture in my home shifted. Granted, getting sober helped, being humble helped. Um, you know, all those things helped, but having this framework and a language in which to communicate effectively to each of them collectively and individually changed everything. And I was coming off, not a great track record, right? Like I'm sure they felt like they couldn't be themselves with me for the longest time, whether they could put words to that or not. I don't think so. Um, but having this safe place in a language and understanding, and a willingness to see where their come from is, not only did it empower them, but I learned a hell of a lot more about myself and the world through the lenses in which they see the world. So I was like, cool, I've got three of the nine types understood now. Now, what can I do to learn about the other six? And that's where I started bringing it into the workplace. And at that time I was about six months sober and accidentally fell into network marketing, which I am least likely on paper to make that possible, especially with zero social network at this point. You know, I'm like, Hey, I'm that single mom that went to rehab, join my team. I'm the healthiest version of myself. Like I am the epitome of strength and leadership and all the things. And you know what I, like I said to you earlier, transparency and vulnerability was where I found my strength and my power. Yeah. And it stuck. And I truly wanted to help people. And I truly wanted to know the way, go the way and show the way. And uh, the the dangling the carrot of um, independence, autonomy and control through passive and residual income was speaking my language. It was a perfect storm of timing. But I was like, damn, I just came from a 100% male dominated industry. This is the opposite. I don't notoriously do well with women. So how am I going to do this and communicate with women when that's not my jam typically enter the Enneagram again? And again, telling no one and not saying, oh, let's hear Enneagram type because I wanted it honestly as little, my secret weapon. Sure. And, uh, and honestly, I just didn't want to like do that because it's creepy. (laughs) And so I just like, I, I got better and, and definitely more curious about the humans that were in front of me. Every single human, whether it was for that business out in the world, somebody, you know, ringing up my groceries, I genuinely got curious because I care, not curious to be safe, not curious to survive, which is how I spent the first 40 years, but curious to care and curious to lead. 
And when I was talking to people, I was like, ah, I know at least what center of intelligence they fall into, which is one of three types. It's like, cool. I, I know I'm down to three here. And once I could kind of, you know, dig a little deeper then boom, I would know what motivates them. And I would speak to that. And I would know when I land, because I would hear things like, oh my gosh, it's like, you read my mind. Oh my right. gosh. I just met you. It feels like you've known me my whole life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You see right through me, me and my soul. I'm like, yes, I do. And now let yeah. me help. And that earns credibility, trust. And when you do that with people from a genuine integrity filled place with beautiful right. intent, magic happens, not just in me and my business, but I went on to help create seven different millionaires in that sales organization. And my favorite statistic of all is that out of those seven millionaires, six different Enneagram types are represented and not one of them was an eight like me. Wow. That's so cool. But still told no one I was using the Enneagram yeah. that whole time. What are the three centers of intelligence? So the three centers of intelligence, we have the instinctual or body center, which is where I fall. The eights, nines, and ones are up there. All three motivated by a form of independence, autonomy, and control. How that looks for all three, totally different. How they go about it, totally different. But they're very instinctual. They all three are like, what is happening now? And what do I need to do about it? That's why I'm great in crisis. Like, yeah. I'm definitely the person you call in a crisis because of that, right? Then we have the feeling or heart center, which is where you fall. The twos, threes, and fours are there, all motivated by a form of significance. Again, what that means to those three types and how they go about it, totally different. But you can tell when somebody's motivated by a form of significance. Um, you guys go to what do I feel about this and what has happened past tense. You kind mm -hmm. of like look for evidence of the past <clears throat> because that's how you kind of know how to shift in this world to be and feel significant. And then in the thinking center of intelligence or the head center of intelligence, these are the five, sixes, and sevens. They are all motivated by a form of certainty. Again, what that looks like and, and what that means to them and how they go about it, all very, very different. Um, they are very much forward thinking, what could happen? And what do I think about this? And that's why they're great innovators and um strategists and things like that. Now we do use all three centers of intelligence, and this is why we're more than just a number. And this is why I hate the bullshit trendy crap that is out there on the Enneagram, because it's like, yeah, if you only focus on your core type, you are putting yourself in a box and you yeah. aren't making excuses. We do use all three centers of intelligence, but our home base and our core motives and our core fears reside in one. And it's how we learn to elegantly move through the other three centers of intelligence that we become really strong, critical thinkers, very emotionally intelligent and, you know, pull these other levers, yeah. you know, having the right tool for the job is really, really important. Whether you're doing a DIY project or you're talking to humans, right? if I just lead with my eight all the time, like I'm leaving wreckage in the, yeah. in the past. So I have to yeah. know where and how to pull these other level levers and in the centers of intelligence is where part of the framework lives for each and every one of us. Okay. How common is it for people to misdiagnose themselves? Cause this is a self-assessment. Yeah. There's kind of two ways to go about it. You know, you can you know, explore this like Disneyland. If like, you don't care if you don't see everything the, the whole time, you'll kind of just dive in, go here one time, go here one time, and you can take the Enneagram journey and do it that way. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, I find it very hard for most humans to be so self-aware to see what's at the core of who we are, because we've, you know, piled on, especially right. if you've got decades under your belt. Now, the other way to go about it is taking an online assessment, which is an okay starting point, but you have to go in knowing that all those online assessments are inaccurate 65 to 70% of the time. Wow. And usually when you are falling into the Enneagram world, usually you're wanting to use this tool to create change and to have transformation. And, you know, I've done this, not just in the Enneagram world, but in others, like I want my pain to stop right now. Give me the easy button and boom, let me take an online quiz to tell me who the heck I am. Yeah. And boom, here I am. Cause the one that I took originally, I was mistyped as well. I was typed as a three. And although I loved that, <laughs> like behaviorally looking at me, you might think I'm a three, but motivationally, I couldn't be further 
mm. from a three. So if you're going to take one of those online assessments, even the paid ones, they are inaccurate a lot of the time, but it's a good starting point to kind of start reverse engineering. But the, the Holy grail way is like to get in front of me. Yeah. Um, take my assessment, my assessment that I have, um, available is over 95% accurate and wow. only three or four that I've done. And I've done thousands of them have been slightly skewed. And usually it's, you know, extreme, extreme trauma or some mental health stuff going on. Wow. Um, but yeah, if you're going to use this tool, the, the most important thing is having the right information because it is a system in a framework. And if you have the wrong information, it's like plugging in the wrong court GPS right. court. To yeah. your, your GPS thing and you're going in the wrong direction, you might have fun <laughs> and, and take an adventure. But if you want to use this as the, the tool that is so powerful and it is like, I highly recommend yeah. kind of going that route. Would or you be able, yeah, totally. Would you be able to give us like, I don't know, two or three sentences that sort of describe maybe the drivers or the challenges or whatever that might be for each of the types. So someone listening could maybe start to place themselves in one of the types. Yeah. Let's start in the heart center. Um, so the twos, threes, and fours, like I said, all motivated by a form of significance, um, twos find their significance in what they do, what they achieve, or I'm sorry, what they do for other people and how they serve. Like they're called the considerate helper. Um, that's amazing. It's why they intuitive their superpowers. They intuitively know what people and situations need without words being said. That's also their kryptonite. Now for each of these Enneagram types, the very thing that is their superpower is the kryptonite. The good news is, is the only thing you have to change is the come from, right? You don't have to change a damn thing about who you are. Hallelujah. That was like my first like exhale in learning about this. Like, thank God, like I'm intense. That's not changing, but how do I you know, leverage this for good. Yeah. And how we switch the superpower or the kryptonite to the superpower is the come from the superpower of the two, you know, um, doing and, and intuitively knowing what people need without words being said, it's only the superpower when it's coming from love, compassion, empathy, service, and grace. Now that same intuitively knowing what situations call for and leading them into overgiving, people pleasing, and codependency Got is it. when they do it from a place of fear, insecurity, unworthiness, shame, guilt, and ego. Got it. So big difference. Big yeah. difference. And yeah. you'll know like you're doing it from that if you have resentment, if you're angry, if you have expectations, um, you know, all the things. Now, threes also significance. Um, the competitive achiever, but their significance comes in what they do, what they achieve and how they appear in the world. Their biggest fear is not being the best. Yeah. Right. And their superpower is see a goal, hit a goal. You know, this you're, you're the queen of it. Right. And you've also had this become your kryptonite with a yeah. body breakdown with relationship breakdowns, right? Because you can be so fixated on the end zone or the goal line. Like I said, where you miss the soul line. Yep. Right. And threes are prone to burnout, body breakdowns, health problems, relationship troubles. Right. Yeah. Cause it's, I'm going to no, win it at all costs at all costs. Yeah. Fear, insecurity, unworthiness, shame, guilt, or ego. Yeah. What you're doing today and why it's your superpower. And you live this is because you operate in love, compassion, empathy, service, and grace, at least 95% of the time. Now we're humans. So it's sneaky and muscle memory. Like I said, is no joke. 5% is a good those are good odds, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now in the, um, the last one in the heart center is the four, the individualist, the romantic, or the intense creative, their significance is totally different how they go about it. Theirs is an internal job. They're here to figure out who they are in this world, almost without the world telling them who they are. They yeah. want to, you know, explore this, you know, the musicians, the artists, the copywriters, the storytellers, the comedians, um, you know, the foodies, all these people kind of fall I and mean, there's no fours that are alike. They're probably the hardest to type. Yeah. Honestly, um, most fours get mistyped as a seven or two or, or something else. Um, but theirs is an internal job. Their biggest fears of being abandoned. And so unfortunately, especially in the world we live in the two or the fours, you know, they are authentic and true to themselves till they look up and look around at the rest of the world and start comparing themselves. Got it. And because they feel like they're so misunderstood and they often are, they kind of morph into whatever the world wants them to be. And this creates internal um, torture, 
yeah. honestly, they're most prone to like depression and things like that. Um, Anthony Bourdain, Robin Williams, Howard Stern, all Enneagram fours. Wow. <clears throat> all right. Now in the thinking center, we have the five, six, and seven. Again, all motivated by a form of certainty. How fives go about it, they're the um, investigator or the quiet specialist. They're typically, um, stereotypically, the most introverted on the Enneagram because their certainty comes in the form of information, resources, and wisdom, right? So they're kind of hoarders of yeah. information and resources. And they they that's how they have certainty is by hoarding it. And unfortunately, they're very wise. They are very certain of having this wisdom, but if they feel intruded on, um, that's when they start to panic a little bit. That's why they do introvert and cave themselves in quite a bit, but that's also how we don't get to experience their gifts. Right. Right. Um, when a five understands that they can step out into the world and yes, they, they might be peopling a little much. They can always go back to their cave, but when they step into that is amazing. And sometimes all that information creates this internal fear and anxiety going on, even though on the outside, you may not see that, um, that can happen for fives. Sixes certainty comes in being prepared for worst case scenario at all times. They have usually 10 different plans and spreadsheets <laughs> for all the worst case scenario. Um, <clears throat> they're great to have on a team though. Um, super prepared master troubleshooters. Um, they ask lots and lots of questions to feel like they're get you know, you have to give them certainty. Yeah. Um, they're called the loyal skeptic for a reason. They're very, very loyal once they trust you, but it takes a long time for them because if they're going to surrender their certainty with you, you better do what you say you're going to do. I mean, this is recorded, but I think Mike is a six just by you talking. I could, I could see that. Yeah. I could see that they're amazing. They're yeah. amazing. Uh, but they can also get tripped up on, not taking steps forward without having all the information. So like surrendering to the faith that like, no matter what, no matter how prepared you are, like COVID really threw the curveball to the sixes because how could they have not seen that coming? Mm. Like sixes hate when they don't see it coming because they feel like they see everything coming. Um, and knowing this is what I usually tell sixes, even if the unthinkable happens, you are so ultra prepared and you are so wise and, and you have all these skill sets in troubleshooting that even if you didn't see this coming, you will be able to handle it and yeah. you'll handle it better than you can even imagine. But that's a hard thing for a six to do. Yeah. Um, and finally in the thinking center are the sevens and my daughter, the seven is why I dove headfirst into the Enneagram because I don't even know how these people function half the times. <laughs> Um, and ironically, sevens are some of my closest friends as well. Yeah. So I have the most to learn from them. She was very triggering for me. Obviously, I have the most to learn from these types. Um, their certainty comes in knowing that all options are available to them at all times. Our friend Chris, <laughs> our mutual friend Chris is an Enneagram seven. He likes all the options. Um, and you can't tell a seven that they can't do something. Mm. This is how you lose them. And when I think back to like my daughter, I was trying to like, you know, exude my power on her and tell her what she's going to do. And she's like, yeah, peace out sister. Like I am going to bolt and chase every shiny object to prove to you that I can have whatever I want. And that is the gift of the Enneagram seven is they believe anything's possible. And given the right container and environment, they actually create magic in this world. Steve jobs, you know, Macintosh people told him he couldn't do what he wanted to screw. Apple. I think I lost you. Are you there? Yep. Okay. There you go. Oh, Steve Jobs, Apple. Great. Yep. Yeah. So Steve Jobs and Apple, like seriously, that is the epitome of telling a seven they can't do something. And they're like, yeah, hold my beer. Watch me. <laughs> um, and so what's cool about Enneagram sevens and what I've learned is I don't have to change my intensity. They actually really love that energy, but I have to be a wordsmith with them because at all, if I ever articulate at all that something's not possible for them, you can lose their credibility and trust. Yeah. And then they'll chase a shiny object if they're not kind of grounded in who they are. 
Um, that's their superpowers, believing anything's possible and not getting tripped up by the no's, the obstacles, the, the failures, even they find fun in a failure sometimes, which again, like, I don't know how they function and I, <laughs> I freaking am obsessed with them. Um, and they do see the world through a lens of optimism and you know, obviously that's something I constantly have to learn. Yeah. Um, the final center of intelligence has the eight, the nine, and the one, all three motivated by a form of independence, autonomy, and control. How the eight, the active challenger, the controller goes about it is through power and strength, right? That's how I measure eights measure independence, autonomy, and control is through, am I the most powerful person in the room? Yeah. And that's my strength. That is my superpower. Cause I usually am. Um, but that's also been my kryptonite when it was coming from fear, insecurity, unworthiness, shame, guilt, and ego. Right. And the thing about eights is we will force, we will push against everything and everything to show you ourselves in the world that we're strong. And we hurt a lot of people along the way, if we're not careful. Yeah. And that's why vulnerability and transparency is really important. But the biggest fear of an eight is being betrayed, violated, or put in a vulnerable situation. So a lot of eights are lone wolves, although they really crave support. Yeah. But the thing about wanting support and actually surrendering to support means they have to reconcile that that actually isn't a weakness. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of that strong. I feel like there's a lot of similarities between threes and eights. And there I is. have a lot of eights in my life and I've had a lot of tumultuous eight relationships. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're tough. Yeah. And Enneagram eight women are grossly misunderstood because men that are eights, like seriously, sure. like, they're different. celebrated. Yeah. yeah. Martin Luther King um, was an Enneagram eight. Mother Teresa also an Enneagram eight though, like a healthy one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, that has been my learning is learning that my vulnerability is my strength, Yeah. but I had to recalibrate that measuring stick for sure. Because most Enneagram eights, men or women, um, have had outside, um, visuals of what strong is and what's celebrated in the world, right? right. It's been socialized what strong is, and especially that masculine energy. Mm -hmm. Um, but once I, really could hone in on my feminine energy. I'm more powerful than I ever was yeah. when I was fighting people all yeah. left and, right and beating the shit out of people. <laughs> um, Enneagram nines, they find independence, autonomy, and control in um, creating harmony within mm. and in their environment. They're called the adaptive peacemaker. Um, you wouldn't think that they are about independence, autonomy, and control, but they're a little stealthy with it, right? They're like, I don't care whatever you want. Um, yeah, let's create kumbaya harmony for us all. And that's actually how they believe they have control. Wow. Now, a lot of times they'll settle for that short-term harmony and create long-term disharmony. And when that happens, resentment piles up inside of them. The anger is there. You may not see it because it comes out in passive aggressive kind of behavior, very rarely language, but more passive aggressive behavior, like, um, selective hearing, stonewalling, procrastination. Mm. That's how they feel. They have control is by kind of operating like that. We're eights. We're like, we'll cut you. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we get our control. Whereas nines kind of like, will kind of shut you out yeah. and almost like not let themselves desire anything because then that could have a hold on them. But when a nine, which I believe is the universe, the divine spirit, God, I believe that energy is a nine on the Enneagram because when they can embrace that conflict, which is their biggest fear actually is the greatest catalyst for change. And of course, because they do operate um, from a place of harmony and the greatest good for us all, when they can have this relationship with conflict and know that short-term disharmony creates a long game harmony and change, that's when they're the greatest change makers in the world, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but that's really challenging for them because yeah. conflict is like, Ugh! they want to just throw up. And last but not least are the Enneagram ones, the reformer, um, the perfectionist, the improver. I like to call them the warden. Um, <laughs> they are motivated by independence, autonomy, and control in the form of being righteous and good. And if they're not that, then they're the opposite. And so they will hold on for dear life for what they believe is right. And they have a hard time apologizing. They are the integrity police. They are the high standard people. They are incredible, impeccable, meticulous human beings. 
And as long as they can live in some gray area, this works out well for them, but it's very challenging for them because if it's not black and white, then it's not so great. Yeah. And they have to reconcile that gray area is actually their friend and not sweating some of the small stuff and learning how to admit when they're wrong. And it doesn't mean that they're terrible out of control people. Um, but some of the best people to be teachers, um, mentors, when they can embrace that part of who they are, that yeah. gray area, actually where all their control and greatness comes, but it's really, really hard for an Enneagram. One. Yeah. I, I, I have so much compassion for them because it's so hard. It's so hard to be I that black and white, to be yeah. gray area. I wouldn't doubt if I misdiagnosed myself taking a test that I would pull up a one. Well, you probably, I'm guessing if, if I was guessing your tri-type, which means, you know, your core type is three, that's not changing, but where you fall and dominate in the other centers of intelligence, I would guess you probably are a three, seven, eight, like a hmm. mover and shaker yeah. or a three, seven, one. Yeah. So like you have one of each of the centers, yeah. um, three, seven, eight is the mover and shaker. Which That's what my mom always called me. <laughs> kind of, it kind of tracks for you. Yeah, um, but the one yeah. resonates really, really deeply. I have yeah. such an issue with like injustice and rules, which are not real. It's, like it's injustice for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, you know all all of that, like black and white, and the integrity and all that stuff. I'm just like, oh, I, and there's so much resentment that bubbles up if I feel like somebody's cheating or, you know, yeah. not following the rules that aren't really the rules because they're just in my head, but. <laughs> Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, you know what, like that's the beauty in the framework of the Enneagram, especially the ones that I struggle with the most in the past, which were ones and threes, yeah. ironically, ones, threes, and eights are often mistyped as each other. Big shocker there. Um, but recognizing like the lens in which they see the world, although it's not the same lens I look through, I have a lot to learn, especially from those yeah. two types. And so and so it, and so it is. And so it is. And there you have it. The Enneagram yeah. just like beautifully laid out. So wonderful. There's so many other things you could talk about too, yeah. which we're not going to get into today. Maybe we'll have you back because you can get into the wings and all the other things. Oh yeah. I know there's so, so much, much more. there's so much before we put a bow on everything, where can people find you? If they want to take your Enneagram assessment, if they want to work with you, what do you have going on? You can go to one of two space, spaces to easily find these. Um, my website, tracyomalley.com. All of that's there. Instagram, Tracy underscore O'Malley. I also do have a podcast called Lead with the Enneagram. We've just hit 400 episodes, so you can binge it for days and days and days and days and days. And, days and um, kind of, and I, I specialize mostly in leadership in your home teams and your professional teams, um, because I take the holistic approach to who we are as human beings. So yeah. definitely can dive in there. I love it. Are you ready for some rapid fire? Ooh, these are my favorite things. I love Ooh, Really? Yeah. Okay. Favorite movie. Ooh. Um, when a man loves a woman, like I said, of back course. in the day, that was probably one of the greatest change making movies of yeah. my life. Are you currently reading or listening to anything? Oh yes. You guys, um, especially if you have some mother wounds, there's a book called mother hunger. Wow. That one's a good one. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Great. If you were to give a Ted talk on nothing you're known for, what would it be? Ooh, gosh, nothing I'm known for. Uh, probably the impact of serial killer documentaries on our psyche. If you go to bed, listening to them. Okay. I love it. Yeah. They're my lullabies. <laughs> that's so crazy. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Guilty pleasure. Oh, guilty pleasure. I don't feel guilty about it. Yeah. Uh, red velvet cake and good sex. Yes. Love it. Sometimes so at the good. same time. I just yes. love both of them. Well, with the serial killer thing on in the yeah. background. <laughs> Honestly, those are, that's actual has happened. You heard it here first. Valentine's Day is around the corner. I know exactly oh, yeah. what you We need. go to bed and he's like, which murder are you watching right now? And then we'll get into it. So yeah. 
Facts. Oh my gosh. So funny. We end every episode with the same question. I named the company Digital Business Evolution because I believe we're always evolving and growing. And as we evolve and grow, so do our businesses. What is your next personal or business evolution? Ooh, girlfriend. I just signed on with a creative director to help me put a visual to who I am, what this brand is. I've never done it. I've never wanted to do it. Um, no longer am I going to be flying under the radar and being the best kept secret, which yes. terrifies me so desperately, but also excites the shit out of me. That four-year-old in me who felt like she could yeah. not speak up and shine is ready to come out and play. And so in 2024, I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I'm, I'm very so excited. excited. Oh my God. I'm so excited. It's going to be edgy for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, okay. You got to send me some mood boards when they come in. I, I want to see. I love that I stuff will. so much. Tracy, thank you so much. I adore you. I really do. I, I love, love you, you so much. This is such a fun conversation. It started so, so deep and powerful. And then yeah. we got into so much fun Enneagram stuff. So friends, if you love this episode, which I'm sure you did take a screenshot, share it out on social tag Tracy at Tracy underscore O'Malley tag me at I am Jessica DeRose. Let us know what some of your takeaways were better yet. See if you could type yourself from Tracy's explanation and then shoot us a DM and let us know what type you think you are, or just post it on stories and let us know what type you are. And maybe you'll get it right. We don't know. We'll see. As always, yeah. As always, friends, cheers to your evolution. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you loved this episode, I invite you to be a part of our ripple effect and share it with a friend. And please, if you feel called, take 30 seconds to leave a five-star review and I'll be forever grateful. Until next time, cheers to your evolution.